Nimrod. The first among the leaders of the corrupt men was Nimrod. His father Cush had married his mother at an advanced age, and Nimrod, the offspring of this belated union, was particularly dear to him as the son of his old age. He gave him the clothes made of skins with which God had furnished Adam and Eve at the time of their leaving paradise. Cush himself had gained possession of them through Ham. From Adam and Eve they had descended to Enoch, and from him to Methuselah and to Noah, and the last had taken them with him into the ark. When the inmates of the ark were were about to leave their refuge. Ham stole the garments and kept them concealed, finally passing them on to his firstborn son, Cush. Cush, in turn, hid them for many years. When his son Nimrod reached his 20th year, he gave them to him. These garments had a wonderful property. He who wore them was both invincible and irresistible. The beasts and birds of the woods fell down before Nimrod as soon as they caught sight of him arrayed in them. And he was equally victorious in his combats with men. The source of his unconquerable strength was not known to them. They attributed it to his personal prowess and therefore they appointed him king over themselves. This was done after a conflict between the descendants of Cush and the descendants of Jophath, from which Nimrod emerged triumphant, having routed the enemy utterly with the assistance of a handful of warriors. He chose Shonai as his capital. Then he extended his dominion further and further until he rose by cunning and forced to be the sole ruler of the whole world, the first moral to hold universal sway, as the ninth ruler to possess the same power will be the Messiah. His impiousness kept pace with his growing power. Since the flood, there had been no such sinner as Nimrod. He fashioned idols of wood and stone and paid worship to them. But not satisfied to lead a godless life himself, he did all he could to tempt his subjects into evil ways, wherein he was aided and abetted by his son Mardon. This son of his outstripped his father in iniquity. It was their time and their life that gave rise to the proverb, Out of the wicked cometh forth wickedness. The great success that attended all of Nimrod's undertakings produced a sinister effect. Back. Men no longer trusted in God, but rather in their own prowess and ability, an attitude to which Nimrod tried to convert the whole world. Therefore, people said, since the creation of the world, there has been none like Nimrod, a mighty hunter of men and beasts and a sinner before God. And not all this sufficed unto Nimrod's evil desire. Not enough that he turned men away from God. He did all he could to make them pay divine honors unto himself. He set himself up as a god and made a seat for himself in imitation of the seat of God. It was a tower built out of a round rock, and on it he placed a throne of cedar wood, upon which arose one above the other four thrones of iron, copper, silver, and gold. Crowning all, upon the golden throne lay a precious stone, round in shape and gigantic in size. This served him as a seat, and as he sat upon it, all nations came and paid him divine homage. The Tower of Babel The iniquity of godlessness of Nimrod reached their climax in the building of the Tower of Babel. 
His councils had proposed the plan of erecting such a tower. Nimrod had agreed to it, and it was executed in Shana by a mob of 600,000 men. The enterprise was neither more nor less than rebellion against God, and there were three sorts of rebels among the builders. The first party spoke, Let us ascend into the heavens and wage warfare with him. The second party spoke, Let us ascend into the heavens, set up our idols, and pay worship unto them there. And the third party spoke, let us ascend into the heavens and ruin them with our bows and spears. Many, many years were passed in building the tower. It reached so great a height that it took a year to mount to the top. A brick was, therefore, more precious in the sight of the builders than a human being. If a man fell down and met his death, none took notice of it. But if a brick dropped, they wept because it would take a year to replace it. So intent were they upon accomplishing their purpose that they would not permit a woman to interrupt herself in her work of brick making when the hour of travail came upon her. Molding bricks, she gave birth to her child and tying it round her body in a sheet, she went on molding bricks. They never slackened their, in their work and from their dizzy height they constantly shot arrows toward heaven which returning were seen to be covered with blood. They were thus fortified in their delusion, and they cried, We have slain all who are in heaven. Thereupon God turned to the seventy angels who encompassed his throne, and he spake, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, but they may not, that they may not understand one another's speech. Thus it happened, thenceforth none knew what the other spoke. One would ask for the mortar, and the other handed him a brick. In a rage, he would throw the brick at his partner and kill him. Many perished in this manner, and the rest were punished according to the nature of their rebellious conduct. Those who had spoken, Let us ascend into the heavens, set up our idols, and pay worship unto them there. God transformed into apes and phantoms. Those who had proposed to assault the heavens with their arms, God set against each other so they fell in the combat. And those who had resolved to carry on a combat with God in heaven were scattered, broadcast over the earth. As for the unfinished tower, a part sank into the earth and another part was consumed by fire. Only one third of it remained standing. The place of the tower has never lost its peculiar quality. Whoever passes it forgets all he knows. The punishment inflicted upon the sinful generation of the tower is comparatively lenient. On account of Red Pen, the generation of the flood were destroyed, while the generation of the tower were preserved in spite of their blasphemies and all their other acts offensive to God. The reason is that God sets a high value upon peace and harmony. Therefore, the ge generation of the deluge who gave themselves up to depredation and bore hatred to one another were extirpated root and branch, while the generation of the Tower of Babel dwelling amicably together and loving one another was spared alive at least a remnant of them. Beside the chastisement of sin and sinners, by the confounded of speech, another notable circumstance was connected with the descent of God upon earth. One of only ten such descents to occur between the creation of the world and the day of judgment. It was on this occasion that God and the seventy angels that surrounded his throne cast lots concerning the various nations. Each angel received a nation, and Israel fell to the lot of God. To every nation, a peculiar language was assigned, Hebrew being reserved for Israel, the language made use of by God at the creation of the world.